So um, on Monday, we looked at two artists, one uh, a Belgian, one a Norwegian, um, whom we try to categorize. We're always trying to do that to make you know, the learning of information a little more, uh, a little easier. Um, and they were um, Ensor uh, and Monk, um, precursors of Expressionism. And now I want to talk about um, one of the earliest movements um, of the 20th century, German Expressionism, and that's the Expressionism with a capital E. German Expressionism is a movement of the early 20th century which has very strong theoretical and philosophical bases. So in other words, the art results from these artists having very strong feelings, theoretical feelings about content and about um, formal composition. The art of the German Expressionist is distinguished by, um, also by strongly personal Expressionistic styles. So even though we call these artists German Expressionists, although there were movements within the German Expressionist movement in which artists are working together, um, they have a manifesto, their styles are, are actually quite um, diverse. So we'll try to talk about them in terms of certain characteristics, but you're going to see that diversity represented. German Expressionism is assigned initially the date 1905 as the start. And it is suppressed by Adolf Hitler in 1933 when um, it is referred to as degenerate art. We have already seen artists in the late 19th century moving toward an ever-growing subjective interpretation of reality, moving away from that Renaissance naturalism and Renaissance realism in terms of uh, a painting in particular as an extension of reality. In the early 20th century, the assumption that gradually took hold is that personal expression in art is valuable in and of itself. And again, if you go back to the Renaissance, for the most part, the artist had very little say um, in the finished product, although the artist certainly had a style. They had been trained in a particular style, um, and it was the patron who actually had most of the say in terms of giving direction to the artist, what he wanted. And the idea that an artist should want to have some kind of personal expression represented in the work was considered absurd. Now, there are some artists in, in the Renaissance where that's not completely true and where, in fact, the patrons um, took into account the personality of the artist. For instance, um, Michelangelo Buonarroti, you know, the, the Pope um, said to Michelangelo, do this. Michelangelo said, no, and the Pope said, please. All right, so in a sense, that's the artist taking some control um, over, um, over the art uh, and making it a kind of personal expression. This becomes much more common in the context of the 20th century. And in fact, in the 21st century, we could not imagine that an artist would not be working to create art that it comes from their heart and soul as a kind of personal expression um, of themselves. The development of Expressionism in 20th century German painting is then grounded in this body of critical writings that are produced for the most part in Germany in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, among those who are important uh, for the visual artists whom we're going to be talking about um, is the German philosopher Konrad Fiedler. Konrad Fiedler.
Fiedler wrote about art as the product of the personal spirit of the artist. He rejected what one could call the Renaissance concept of art as imitation of nature. He also did not agree with the Romantics who stressed emotion as the reason for, as the catalyst for artistic production. He said, quote, works of art are not created with emotion. Emotion, therefore, does not suffice for their understanding. Remember, even though I'm quoting, these are philosophers and theoreticians. They're not artists, so this would not be a quote that I would give you uh, for the test. It doesn't mean you shouldn't know it because it's going to help you understand the material we're going to be looking at. Fiedler believed in the possibility of an objective explanation for art. And he also believed in the concept of inner necessity, which he felt was different from emotion. Inner necessity. That sense of compulsion to make art. I have a number of studio artists in this class, and you know what I'm talking about. You need to do it. It's almost like an addiction. Uh, and I have a kind of related story. I'm an art historian. When I go to a department meeting, um, I sit and I listen, and I might take some notes and comment. My colleagues, who are mostly studio artists, uh, painters, ceramicists, sculptors, are all drawing and doodling um, on a piece of paper. And I'm thinking, you're not paying attention, but they are, but they have to, they have to draw. They have to be doing something. It's, it's, it's in their nature uh, to be doing it. So um, it's that inner necessity. Um, and I have made art. I've taken art classes. I've made art. I don't have a need to do it, though. I can stop at any time, you know. I don't get that um, addiction. So Fiedler talks about that inner necessity. Theodore Lips uh, was a pioneer psychologist, German psychologist. He reintroduced the concept of empathy, Einfühlungen. I will spell it in German, E I N. F U H L U N G. Einfühlungen or empathy as a concept had great currency at the beginning of the 20th century. You, you can't prove empathy. I mean, when, when people tell you they feel empathetic, you have to believe them based on your own experience of empathy, right? And if you feel you haven't experienced it, then that's a problem. It's the idea or the notion that assumes through some psychic communication, um, some knowledge and psychic communication on the part of the observer of art or the participant in a situation, that aesthetic enjoyment and experience of the work of art will come. Empathy. In a state of empathy, the boundaries between personal identity and the artistic object disappear. So separateness becomes oneness. This happens to us on different levels. If you are an empathic person, um, it can happen to you when you're just watching a movie at a movie theater or listening to music. Um, you feel very strongly about what you are seeing, about what you are learning, about what you are hearing. And there's a kind of emotional um, involvement um, that goes uh, along with it. When your friend starts to talk to you about a breakup, you know, with another friend, a girlfriend or a boyfriend, um, you tell them, I know what you're saying, I know what you're feeling. That's empathy. And it may be because you've experienced something that's similar, all right? So again, separateness is replaced by 
uh, oneness. The theory of empathy is based on a kind of metaphysical concept that the subject exists in the object. The subject, um, the individual, can even exist within the work of art. So let me tell you about a personal experience I've had with empathy. Now, I do feel empathy all the time, different degrees, but I had a really strong uh, empathetic experience several years ago. Um, I was at um, a show um, of the works of the... Um, uh, He's both French, he, well, he's a French painter, but Russian-born um, 20th century painter, Chaim Soutine. I don't know if you know his work, S-O-U-T-I-N-E. He um, actually is very famous for painting these huge canvases with slabs of beef, of meat, hanging from them. Um, and they're, they're realistic, but uh, strongly expressionistic. So I was at an entire show um, of his work, and I was walking along looking, and the show was very crowded, and I had a friend with me, and suddenly when I got up to one of the paintings, um, literally, I felt as though I, my body had disappeared, and I had gone into the painting, and I had not been smoking anything. <laughs> um, and I was totally unaware of anyone around me I was in the painting, and it was extraordinary. It was overwhelming because it's, um, it was a painting that was very violent uh, in a way and uh, very frightening, um, but nothing else existed but me and the painting, and I felt that I had a very strong empathic response to that work, that I had become part of the painting. I was within um, that object um, and understood it on a very different level. The idea of empathy also relates to the psychological theories of the Swiss doctor Carl Jung, J-U-N-G, who, has, uh, who wrote about something called a collective unconscious. That is, memories and associations that all humans share and that result in the development of myths and religions and philosophies that are often very similar. We call them by different names, but they're very similar. So it's a very base of human experience, and he felt that empathy was one of those very basic um, human um, experiences. The last um, German I want to talk about here is Wilhelm Voringer. who published a book um, in 1908, called Abstraction and Empathy. And it was a book specifically related to modern art in the early 20th century. Abstraction and Empathy. Abstraction und Einfüllung. In his book, he distinguishes between the desire to create naturalistic works or realistic works versus more abstract representations. And he perceives that the modern artist was moving away from naturalistic representation uh, due to what he calls an inner compulsion to select abstraction from nature. It almost sounds like Gauguin's um, painting lesson with Serrusier, now sort of codified by this German thinker um, in the early 20th century. Voringer became a spokesman for Expressionism. He was fascinated with the possibilities of abstract art, art that moved away from nature, that selected from nature, was dependent upon nature, 
but didn't look like a Renaissance painting. And he had a particular enthusiasm for what was called at that time primitive art, non-Western art. And that's actually quite, quite true of the Germans in general by the late 19th and early 20th centuries. They were in the forefront um, of collecting what so-called primitive art, South Pacific art, art of Central Africa. Um, this was something that they found fascinating because it looked aesthetically so different from concepts of beauty um, and naturalistic representation from the Western tradition. Aspects, then, of all of these kinds of theoretical ideas find their way into the unique personal visions of a number of artists in the early part of the century in Germany. Keep in mind that along with the theoretical underpinnings and more personal approach of the artist was the need for more active participation on the part of the observer. So I would say from this point on, seriously, the observer, the viewer of art, has to take more responsibility. As we move toward greater abstraction, you have to bring more to the table to understand it. So that when people say to you, oh, well, that looks like a piece of crap, my kid could do that, it may be because they don't understand the historical context and the theory behind it, that you need to bring a little more with you. So keep that in mind as we begin to look uh, now at the German Expressionists. German Expressionism begins, as I said, in 1905 with the formation of an association of artists known as Die Brücke, the bridge. The leader of Die Brücke was Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. And by the way, this is um, a link to um, a really great MoMA exhibition in 2002. You don't need to take the link down. You can Google it, Wuka MoMA 2002, um, and you'll find it. Kirchner is spelled K-I-R-C-H-N-E-R. K-I-R-C-H-N-E-R. We're going to look at the work of some other members of the group, um, but there were four major members of the group. Not all of them started um, at the same time, but Ludwig Kirchner um, did. He was one of the original um, artists who formed um, this movement of German Expressionism called um, Die Brücke. These artists joined together to reject historicism, uh, that is, the traditional approach to painting and subject matter, um, to reject academic tradition in order to establish a new aesthetic. If this starts to sound like something that we've talked about before in the context of modern art, it is, because we've looked at 19th century traditions. In Germany, um, for instance, of artists who want to break with um, what's going on in terms of the conservative traditions of the present and go um, and link uh, to the past. Um, and one of the things Die Brücke wanted to do is create a link or a bridge between the present and the past. And that was one of the reasons they chose uh, the name Die Brücke, the bridge. Um, in the left-hand side of this slide, you're, you, you're looking at a um, Die Brücke um, poster here with the bridge uh, represented. Um, it's a work by uh, Kirchner. Um, it, Künstlergruppe means artist group. And so it makes specific reference to, um, to the uh, Brücke group. It dates to 1910. The members of Die Brücke were originally very interested in reviving specifically the arts of the Middle Ages in Germany, especially um, the predominant position of Germany in the Middle Ages and even into the early Renaissance period of woodblock prints, woodcuts. They studied a wide variety um, of woodblock prints and it inf influenced their style. So in fact, what you're seeing in the work on the left-hand side, this cover, um, is in that tradition of the woodblock uh, print, very simple, 
a sense of, of um, the, the uh, black um, and white um, and some cutting or carving into the surface um, of the wood block. The German Expressionists were influenced very strongly by the subjective approach to form taken by artists whom they were very much aware of, artists outside of Germany. And among those artists were Vincent van Gogh, um, Henri Matisse, and the Fauves. They also uh, knew the work of Edvard Munch, the Norwegian, especially um, through his prints. So these young German artists at the beginning of the 20th century were not completely isolated. They knew what was going on um, in other countries. The manifesto that you're looking at on the right-hand side is also um, a work in a woodcut print by Kirchner. It dates to 1906. He literally cuts the, the, the wood block print in these sort of ancient letters, um, and um, it becomes a statement um, of belief. And it basically says, with faith in development and in a new generation of creators and appreciators, we call together all youth. As youth, we carry the future and want to create for ourselves freedom of life and movement against the long-established older forces. Everyone who with directness and authenticity conveys that which drives him to creation belongs to us. It's a very open sort of proclamation um, of what they're looking for. You need to be young. You need to be moving forward. You need to be going in a different direction. And we're not going to um, actually judge you based on any other uh, criteria. Beginning in 1906, portfolios containing original woodcut prints of members of the group were issued. This, for instance, is a portfolio cover for the artist um, Karl Schmidt Rotluf, also an early member of Die Burke, by Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. By 1909, these annual portfolios of prints, which contained three to four original prints, were devoted to the work of one artist, although a different artist would make a woodcut design for the cover. Only about 20 copies were ever printed and were distributed to non-professional subscribers. As you might imagine, a complete portfolio today would be worth a small fortune. What we see in this portfolio cover is a cover that is uh, dominated by a couple of things stylistically. First of all, the choice of red, red and white. White um, is ac actually um, a representation of all colors. Um, red uh, is um, a, a very intense, a brilliant, hot uh, color. And together, um, in terms of contrast, it creates a very strong uh, kind of imagery. The forms that we see represented on this portfolio cover that represent, you can see at the top, uh, Die Brücke, 1909, the individual forms themselves are quite angular and abstract. And as we look um, and try to discern exactly what we're looking at, it becomes quite difficult. Um, it looks as though, for instance, we have a mask um, here uh, that uh, may be very much based in the tradition of interest um, in African masks of German artists at this period. Um, we have another sort of iconic image that's very difficult to decipher in terms of what's actually represented. I go down to the central image, which actually I can read, and it looks like two masks kissing. Can you see the eyes? And here an eye and profile and a nose and the two mouths coming uh, together. Um, and then um, a somewhat problematic um, image of a figure uh, that's kind of anthropomorphic. In other words, we cannot tell if it's male or female, maybe female if these are breasts. Um, and this figure is sort of reaching down into the pubic area. So again, what we begin to see in um, German um, uh, expressionist representations um, are works which um, are um, highly um, 
filled with a kind of tension, uh, with a kind of sexuality uh, that um, is clearly something that they wanted to, uh, to project in their works. The Berlin Ethnographic Museum at this time contained fine collections of Oceanic and African art, as did the Dresden um, Ethnographic Museum. Keep in mind that an ethnographic museum is a museum that studies uh, human culture. It's not a museum of art. And literally, into the end of the 20th century, uh, most of these, what would have what really should have been considered great works of art were considered ethnographic artifacts. Are you with me on this? So they, uh, in fact, they were different from Western art, which is in um, a, a museum of high art. They're in an ethnographic museum. Um, here I show you a Kirchner, um, sitting woman with wooden sculpture. So this is a painting now. But it's a painting that has um, the same sort of simplicity um, of representation that we began to see, the simplification of form, um, flat areas of color, jagged line that we've seen previously in his woodblock uh, prints. What's particularly interesting here is the direct influence of African sculpture, both as a subject within the painting, but also influencing the abstraction of style. Because you see a woman here um, who is shown at the center. She's, by the way, she has a cigarette. She's somewhat exotic looking. And she is shown next to a work of African sculpture. So I show you here on the right-hand side um, a, a fang sculpture um, from West Africa that dates to um, the late 19th or early 20th centuries. Um, the, the point I wish to make is that clearly the artist is being directly influenced uh, by the, the vitality, the different approach to representation as seen in uh, West African sculpture. But I do not want to say that this is the specific work of art uh, that Kirchner saw. But it also should be kept in mind that at, traditional African sculpture is, is very conservative. The idea of creating something unique something different outside of what has traditionally been done is simply not part um, of what happens in traditional African society. You continue to create the same forms in the same way, using the same kinds of materials and techniques as your father and your grandfather and your great-grandfather. So what I'm saying is um, he would certainly have seen something that's very similar to this, um, what's called a reliquary uh, figure, a figure that is specifically re related to um, ancestor worship. Kirchner was obsessed with the decadence and materialism of the modern world. This is his work called Street Dresden, 1908. Does it remind you of another painting that we just looked at on Monday? Remember that painting? Who was that by? Monk. Yeah, it was by Edvard Monk. It was called Evening on Karl Johann Strasse. And you remember that we thought we saw Monk trying to get away from the crowd on the sidewalk by going down um, the middle of the street. So this is the same sense of a kind of threatening um, world. Um, we see figures here who are really even more ghoulishly painted with much brighter colors, shocking colors than we saw um, in, uh, uh, in Monk's uh, painting. The space is, is compressed. Uh, there is perhaps a bit more um, space in the foreground in this work, but the ground level is turned up, uh, way up to the front of the picture plane, and the use of this bright, bright um, pink um, literally causes the, um, what we would read as the ground level to come forward to the front um, of the picture plane with that distortion of perspective. 
Um, this is a work which, in, again, um, talks about alienation, confrontation, um, in the context of the early 20th century. Indeed, you could actually extrapolate the, de the development of an increasingly industrialized and materialistic society in the early 20th century uh, led to this sense of alienation, led to a nationalistic confrontation among major European nation states, and led to some extent in terms of the, the dysfunction um, of the times to um, World War I. Kirchner enlisted in the army at the beginning of World War I in 1914. He was subsequently discharged in 1915 after suffering a mental and physical breakdown. He recovered enough to eventually continue working um, until his death in 1938. This is a kind of classic uh, German expressionist um, uh, portrait, um, again, using the woodblock or woodcut technique. This is the head of Henry Vandevel by Kirchner. The date is 1917. The war is not over until 1918. Kirchner represents the famous Belgian Art Nouveau architect um, as uh, a man with an exceedingly elongated, distorted uh, face, um, flattened uh, down by the outline of his hair and his jaw, and then literally carved and gouged out in terms of the uh, details um, of his eyes and cheeks. It's a strongly expressive work. It's a very direct approach to representation um, and a very abstract approach to representation, which you have to remember in the context of the period would have been considered exceedingly abstract. For us today, there's no problem. There's a portrait of a man um, who does not look particularly happy. There is a landscape with a village in the background on the left and some mountains on the right-hand side. Carl Schmidt Rotluf was one of the original members of Die Brücke. I, I, I mentioned him previously. He was basically self-taught. He loved woodcut. And again, um, he emphasizes in this self-portrait uh, just the kind of simple gouging of the wood with simple tools to create this contrast between light and dark. And again, it has that mask-like uh, quality that we talked about uh, before. This is a painting by Schmidt Rotluf. So again, one can see the extent to which these artists who were so interested in printmaking would simplify their painting using extremely bold colors to a large extent uh, in German Expressionist art. When you get these discordant colors, these bright colors that fight with each other. It's very much based on their knowledge and admiration for artists. Van Gogh, certainly, but Matisse um, and the Fauve painters. Remember, Fauvism is 1905. This is 1910. So we're, we're seeing um, the inculcation here of an interest in color based in the kind of abstract, non-naturalistic color that these artists um, have experienced. Uh, by looking at art outside uh, of, uh, of Germany. Are, are you starting to get a sense here in these works? I mean, they're, I suppose one could say that they're basically genre paintings, right? I mean, we've seen portraits and <clears throat> we saw um, sort of still life uh, kinds of paintings with people represented with sculpture. Um, here, an Indian with a woman, and we're speaking of um, India from India in the background in um, traditional costume. Um, but despite the fact that it's genre, in other words, they seem to be scenes of everyday life and ordinary people, there's, there's always this sense of tension um, in the work. 
there's always this sense of angst. Remember angst, fear? We first brought it up with, with Monk, um, and it is, it is part of um, an understanding of German painting um, as well. This is a work of the German Expressionist artist Max Pechstein, who joined Die Brücke later. He had studied at the Dresden Academy, so he had um, more of a, 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 a traditional background in the arts. Um, like the other members of Die Brücke, he produced woodcuts, but his best work is considered to be his painting. His major influence was Vincent van Gogh. He saw uh, works of Van Gogh in 1905. He also loved to combine um, exotic subjects and strange juxtapositions of subjects within a painting, along with, of course, the most discordant kind of juxtapositions of color. And that's exactly what we have um, here. Um, a, a, um, an Indian in his brilliant red uh, costume um, is seated on a drum uh, in front of a mirror, which creates yet another kind of layer in terms of the uh, space here, um, and a distortion. In the foreground, for whatever reason, there is a um, nude figure uh, sprawled across the floor, who is very reminiscent of the traditions that we know of the reclining female nude figure. But again, we've never seen one that looked like this. I mean, you can, you can imagine that if there were some old, old critics still living at this time in Europe who remembered Manet and Olympia, again, they'd be saying, oh my gosh, that was the most brilliant piece of painting you could ever have imagined. Because literally, um, this is a figure dominated by, what, two or three or four colors. Any kind of value contrast or definition um, of the yellow, this brilliant yellow color um, of the uh, skin tone is through red. You know, so um, it's, it's very strident. <clears throat> By 1911, most of Die Brücke artists had moved to Berlin. Driven by a lack of recognition and sales in the more provincial Dresden to the south. Berlin had grown into quite an important cultural center after the unification of Germany in 1871. And then by 1913, the group having, remember, first been organized in 1905, in 1913, all of the artists had matured, become more independent, uh, and basically, de Borca dissolved. That's the end, in 1913. But these artists, the Borca artists, were the first important manifestation of modern expressionism in Germany. Despite their distortions of form and color, they retained subject matter, while the expressionism of a second group of German artists we're going to start talking about would eventually see the disappearance of any kind of realistic subject or relationship seemingly to the natural world. And this next group of German artists will lead us directly to what's called non-objective art. Um, art or subject matter in art, which is not specifically derived from a visual observation um, of nature. This group was called Der Blaue Reiter and was organized in Munich in 1911 by um, Franz Marc, a German, and Vasily Kandinsky, a Russian. And I show you Kandinsky um, here. That's uh, W or V in transliteration, A-S-S-I-L-Y, Vasily, and the last name is Kandinsky, K-A-N-D-I-N-S-K-Y. Again, K-A-N-D-I-N-S-K-Y. Kandinsky's uh, dates are 1866 to 1944. Uh, 
Um, they call themselves um, Der Blaue Reiter, which means uh, in German, the blue rider. The blue rider. And I'll spell Der Blaue Reiter for you. Three words. D-E-R, Blaue, capital B is in boy, L-A-U-E. And third word, Reiter, capital R-E-I-T-E-R, the blue writer. The origin and meaning of the name of the group um, is disputed. Riders on horseback were one of Kandinsky's <coughs> early major preoccupations. Furthermore, the color blue was a very important color, um, not only for Kandinsky, but um, it had strong emotional and spiritual connotations for German Romantic poets as well. So there was um, spiritual meaning behind um, an understanding of the use of the color blue or um, even in the um, name um, of a group. De Blau Reiter uh, condoned no specific formal style because they felt that art was the embodiment of the spirit. And if you were true to your own soul, to your own spirit, then that should be the formal manifestation of that spirit. We know that in 1903, Kandinsky had in fact painted a work called The Blue Rider and I show it to you here on the right-hand side. This is a relatively early um, work um, based on the earliest childhood memories that the artist had um, of folk tales uh, taught to him uh, by his Russian grandmother. These very early works of Kandinsky, in fact, are quite charming. They look as though it's almost naive or kind of untrained style. The technique, in fact, um, is um, his interpretation, one might say, of, of Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, maybe even Seurat. Um, the first show of The Blue Rider was in Munich in December of 1911, and it included um, works by Kandinsky, Franz Marc, um, and um, other um, German artists, as well as some French artists. In this case, um, Le Douanier Rousseau. Do you remember Henri Rousseau, who painted those wonderfully naive uh, works that I um, related to the um, end of the 19th century and personal expressionism in France? This um, is um, an exhibition photo um, of this uh, exhibition, which lasted a couple of months between December and January, 1911 and 1912. And it does indeed seem to show very abstract works and very different styles. Um, this is an original cover for a book in the form of a lithograph for the Blue Rider by Kandinsky, and again, the same period of time, 1912. And you do see, I hope you can read, even though it is decoratively abstract, um, a blue horse and a rider. It was the genius of the Russian Kandinsky, who was, in a, in a sense, the spiritual leader of these um, young artists, to want to unify the rational and the irrational um, in art, to find a kind of perfect spiritual um, essence. To trace how and why Kandinsky developed um, as an abstract and then non-objective artist, I think, is interesting. Vasily Kandinsky finished law school in Russia, and in 1893, he decided to go to art school in Munich, Germany. At this time, Munich and Germany were much more progressive than Russia if one wanted to be trained um, as an artist. Um, in around 1897, um, still studying a number of different um, artists and uh, working 
um, as, uh, as a young artist. We are told that Kandinsky first saw the work of Claude Monet. Okay, so it's 1897. You and I have been looking at Monet since the 1870s. So this is, you can see, this is a long way out. But it's a revelation for Kandinsky. At first, he describes the experience by saying, um, I was literally unable to make out any subject in this painting. I didn't know what the hell it was. He didn't say that, I'm saying that. Uh, but basically, that's what he was saying. What was he looking at? He was looking at one of the so-called Haystack series by Claude Monet, in which Monet created a whole series of these, uh, these haystacks um, at different times of the day, in different seasons, in different weather conditions. Well, Kandinsky said, I thought the painter had no right to paint so unclearly. Again, I thought the painter had no right to paint so unclearly. But then he tells us after some reflection, he realized that the actual naturalistic subject, the object um, in the painting, might not be the most important aspect of the painting. So that opens up a whole other realm. It might be what the object um, suggests to us. It may be simply the formal elements that make up the object that are the most important. But he's realizing now that an object, um, the representation of an aspect of nature, is not perhaps the most important kind of painting. I've, I've thrown this up just to give you an idea that if he had continued in this style, we would never have heard of him again. Uh, this is Kandinsky, Portrait of Cherusheva, around 1900. Um, it's a kind of academic, uh, classical painting, and it's not even particularly good in that context. We know by the turn of the century, uh, Kandinsky was, as we can see here, still highly conservative uh, in terms of uh, his art, based um, in this academic background. He had visited Paris in 1889 and again um, in 1892, but he is still exceedingly conservative um, in what he is representing. Remember, the Blue Rider painting that I showed you doesn't come for three years uh, more. And at that point, it's as though he's been released from uh, the uh, chains by which he is attached to the academic classical tradition. One of the things that helped Kandinsky to move away from that tradition was um, his knowledge of Art Nouveau. Now, you have, of course, already looked at um, my Captivate lecture um, on Art Nouveau on our website because you need to use that as some background in my references here to the Art Nouveau influences that we're looking at. In 1901, Kandinsky founded an artist association called Phalanx. You can see the name of the association at the top um, of this uh, poster, this color lithograph from 1901, designed by Kandinsky. This artist association was meant to, quote, further common interests by close cooperation and, above all, to help overcome the difficulties that young artists encounter in getting their work exhibited. So this is this age-old problem, that their works uh, are not being accepted, uh, and so they start their own associations and they um, start exhibiting um, on their own. Um, this work is very much based in a kind of Art Nouveau tradition. There is an emphasis on the kind of organic, plant-like forms, even in the way that the uh, font uh, is represented. That's a very uh, classic kind of Art Nouveau-looking um, font um, built up of blocks of color 
and very decorative and curvilinear, very um, Art Nouveau. Um, the name phalanx is actually referencing um, a, an ancient Roman tradition, and what you see are, and I hope you can see them, two Roman soldiers with helmets and shields and uh, spears. Um, again, richly ornamented and, and conceived in, in an Art Nouveau fashion. And um, they are, in fact, uh, warriors. Um, in the Roman tradition of the phalanx, what you had is um, a series of soldiers in a unit. And the unit stayed close together. And each um, soldier put his shield over the so soldier in front of him. And of course, was also using, getting ready to use a spear. And the phalanx moved forward in a very orderly fashion. And when one member of the phalanx was somehow shot with an arrow and brought down and collapsed, the phalanx um, would then just come together, right, to support you, would move forward to take up that gap. Um, so the whole point is that these are artists in a phalanx, and they'll support each other. They will move forward um, uh, together. Kandinsky studied in Munich at the turn of the century um, and was increasingly influenced by the newest currents in art, by um, the kind of expressionism uh, of, uh, of, uh, of northern painting, by um, the decorative quality of Jungestil or Art Art Nouveau, um, by Impressionism. Wow. That's a kind of messy Impressionism that kind of floats over, goes over to post-Impressionism, right? This is Kandinsky trying to find his legs here, applying a very different color palette from that portrait that we just looked at that is based upon his looking at um, both Impressionism and post-Impressionism. Um, he probably applied the paint here with a palette knife. You can see the kind of thick uh, impasto. Um, of the paint. And sometimes he was even painting out of doors, trying to capture that moment in time like the Impressionists. He lived in Paris between 1906 and 1908. He actually submitted works and participated in the Autumn Salon. The Autumn Salon. And in the winter of 1906-07, he participated in um, a, a Brucke exhibition of graphic works in Dresden. In the early 20th century, he took up residence for a period of time at Murnau in Germany. And in the landscapes and the village scenes that he produced, it is quite clear that um, he has sort of taken a leap of faith here, very much dependent upon uh, the fact that he has been living in Paris. We see a freedom um, of color and of the application of paint that is based upon a knowledge of fauvism. Increasingly, Kandinsky is moving to try to synthesize, bring together an understanding of how color um, uh, can work um, along with form and line, and all of them be, uh, in a sense, equal uh, to each other. He began to paint even more experimental works in 1909. This is called Improvisation Number 6, African. For his experimental paintings, Kandinsky stopped using specific titles, and he chose instead to use uh, musical terminology, such as improvisation, composition. From the time that he was very young, he loved music. Uh, he had a fascination with the ability of music to um, bring out very deep feelings in people. He believed that music was superior to art because he saw music 
and musical language as much more abstract in its vocabulary than art. Now, if you're a musician, you could argue that's really not the case. One is bound by the same kinds of vocabulary, uh, but that's not how Kandinsky um, saw it. Um, in many ways, of course, we've already seen uh, that music was perceived by the symbolists as the greatest um, of the arts because of its um, potential, because of its abstract potential. So we're seeing that same um, interest um, and devotion to music uh, and art, uh, both as potentially abstract languages um, in Kandinsky. Kandinsky began to believe that through the formal elements of uh, composition alone, line, form, color, shape, that he could express human experience in art. Improvisation number six, again, it's not so difficult for us in 2012. What do we have here? Well, we have um, what looks like uh, his impression of um, an African uh, village, uh, there's a building here to one side. There are uh, what look like two women um, who um, have cloth out, and they're um, opening the cloth up. Perhaps they're going to be folding it again. Um, and then you have a kind of very abstract background, but it looks um, as though it could be mountains and clouds and uh, in the sky. He began um, painting increasingly non-representational works in 1910. This is a sketch for composition number two. The actual finished painting was destroyed in World War II. Again, as in improvisation number six, composition number two, sketch, has an intentional kind of ambiguity, um, giving us a few clues uh, about um, actual naturalistic elements um, in the world and then becoming exceedingly abstract. It's actually that pure quality of color that Kandinsky is trying to understand. Um, but there's still some very literal kinds of clues in terms of the iconography of this work. Um, the meaning, as you can imagine, has been um, uh, discussed and, and uh, torn apart and put back together in terms of interpretation. But we have similar figures to figures from his um, African works, um, what look like human figures here on the left-hand side, reclining figures um, here on the right, other figures who seem to be moving out into space, but clearly these are sort of humanoid figures. Did you notice the horse here? Horse and rider. So again, a motif that we see in his work horse and rider attempting to um, jump over what looks like a kind of impossible uh, sort of barrier. Um, and then other very abstract images um, in the background. Um, there's a sky. There are clouds again. Um, it's very difficult um, to tell exactly, even though he gives us a few sort of literal clues. When this painting was exhibited for the first time in 1910, and remember, we're only looking at the sketch. The original painting does not survive. The critics hated it. One said that it looked like a good design for a carpet, and another said it was created by a crazy man. The color of the work, I think you would have to agree with me, is exceptionally beautiful. It's not only based on Kandinsky's growing ability to work with color, to manipulate it, but on his admiration for Henri Matisse, whose joy of life he must have seen at the Salon des Indépendants, the independent salon, in the spring of 1906. So you remember when I pointed out some of those figures, some of those reclining figures, figures out um, in um, the scape of Kandinsky's uh, composition? Well, we see um, sort of the essence of those figures here. We see the abstract use of color on the part of Henri Matisse in a work called The Joy of Life, 1906. The degree to which Kandinsky 
uh, saw color increasingly as having the ability to convey spiritual qualities and to be on its own the content, the subject of the painting, is evident in his writings, especially his important work concerning the spiritual in art. Kandinsky finally came to the conclusion that objective representation in art should be eliminated. And that by eliminating the object, in a sense, the pictorial representation, you could achieve the spiritual in art. As an expressionist, he believed that ultimate harmony of color and form reflects inner meaning. Is it going to be the same for everyone? It may not be exactly the same, but Kandinsky actually um, uh, wrote in Concerning the Spiritual in Art that certain colors can provo provoke certain feelings and have certain meanings. So if you want to express that um, in a work of art, then you need to use those colors in a certain way. As Conrad Fiedler had stated, the most important thing in the question of form is whether or not the form has grown out of inner necessity. And for Kandinsky, it was inner necessity. Kandinsky said, color is the keyboard, the eyes are the hammers, the soul is the piano with many strings. The artist is the hand that plays. It's a lovely description of how music is created. Color is the keyboard, the eyes are the hammers, the soul is the piano with many strings, the artist is the hand that plays. He devoutly believed that color directly influences the soul. Now, if you are a rationalist thinker, and I had also were listening to me in the context of color theory in the 19th century, you're going to say, this is very problematic. Um, Kandinsky's approach was strongly metaphysical and mystical. He had studied theosophy, which um, we mentioned before in the context of the 19th century, um, a kind of holistic um, um, religion um, or spiritual way of life. Kandinsky makes reference to the theosophical ideas in his writings. He was fascinated by the affinities between art and religion and the fact that art was a new religion. And again, this is not new, but it's kind of culminating in some, in some extraordinarily different works. Um, Gauguin saw his art as a new kind uh, of religion. And you remember, he was Christ um, in the context of that religion. Furthermore, in his studies of science, Kandinsky's belief in a rational world was completely shaken by early advances um, in atomic theory in the early um, 20th century. Um, and most specifically, quantum theory. I am not going to pretend to understand uh, quantum theory, uh, but quantum theory evolved as a, a branch of theoretical physics at the beginning of the 20th century. And in quantum theory, we um, attempt to understand the fundamental properties of matter. In 1897, a British physicist named J.J. Thompson described the presence of electrons as part of the atom. Now, that's something that you learned in middle school. You, you know, took your science classes and you learned about um, atoms. But this is new in 1897, in which there are um, electrons. Um, by 1900, the German physicist Max Planck laid the foundations for the development of what is called quantum theory. Before Max Planck, scientists regarded matter as indestructible. 
Planck put forward the theory that matter was electricity in constant motion, that matter was energy, and that the universe was in a constant state of flux. That always reminds me of the Woody Allen movie. It might be Annie Hall, which is one of his classic movies, I think, from the late 70s, um, in which the little boy um, is in, in, um, sitting at the kitchen table, and his mother is there, and she's scolding him because he hasn't done his homework. And he says to her, but the universe is expanding. <laughs> which I think is extremely funny as an excuse not to do your homework. So literally, you know, this, this child has, whatever his concept or understanding is about matter and the universe, he's, he's just, you know, he's so stunned by it that, that he can't do his homework. He, you know, the universe is expanding. Who knows what's going to happen? The universe is in a constant state um, of flux. By 1911, another British scientist named Ernest Rutherford described a positively charged nucleus surrounded by electrons. So we are learning about this basic component of all life, um, about the atom. This was followed in 1913 by the Danish physicist Niels Bohr, who described electrons as circling the atom in fixed orbits. I mean... This is enough to make your mind explode. I mean, I can't even get my mind um, around it. Kandinsky's belief in a knowledgeable fixed world was completely shaken by these scientific advances. Uh, what, literally, what it comes down to is what you're looking at here, what you're looking at here is not the reality, right? Um, we're, we're energy, we're electricity, we are um, something completely different from, we thought, from what we thought the physical world was. Kandinsky said, these discoveries struck me with terrific impact, comparable to that of the end of the world. Let me repeat that. These discoveries struck me with terrific impact, comparable to that of the end of the world. In the twinkling of an eye, the mighty arches of science lay shattered before me. All things became flimsy. There was no strength. There was no certainty. And I have two more of these uh, physicists whom I just mentioned, Ernest Rutherford and Niels Bohr. Composition number seven um, is the last work that we're going to look at today. And in a way, one could say it's a kind of culmination um, of many of the, the theories and the ideas that uh, Kandinsky is coming to terms with in terms of his art. This painting is the most monumental and complex painting which Vasily Kandinsky would do prior to World War I. It's called Composition Number 7, 1913. If one did not know about how he worked and how serious he was in terms of the theories behind his art, one could say this is a massive mess of color and line and form. But Kandinsky created over 30 preparatory drawings and watercolors and oil studies before he painted this work. In a sense, he is in the tradition of the academic painter who does the preparation before the final work. Some scholars um, have divined uh, themes of last judgment, of the end of the world, the deluge, um, of a garden, um, in all of the details of the work. Because again, from time to time, he gives us perhaps one little clue um, in terms of the um, iconography. But for the most part, um, the subject is not recognizable as anything of this world. It is a turbulent other world of abstract shapes and colors. The implication is that Kandinsky was convinced that art leads to spiritual understanding and spiritual renewal. 
Um, as he demonstrated in Concerning the Spiritual and Art in his book, he uses his sense of how different colors affect the emotional response of the spectator. He uses his sense of line and color and form to create and concentrate on creating a spiritual work. By 1918, uh, Kandinsky had joined the Department of Visual Arts in uh, the new um, um, regime, the People's Commissariat for Enlightenment in Moscow. He begins to participate in overseeing developments of Russian art. He reorganizes museums in Russia. By 1920, he contributes to the founding of the Institute of Artistic Culture, a communist um, systemization of artistic theories. And increasingly, um, his ideas, his teaching, and his art do not correspond to what the new Soviet state is intent upon, and that is uh, to sell the party line. The best way to sell the party line is with realism, not spiritual abstraction. In 1921, he leaves Russia for Berlin. In 22, he moves to Weimar in Germany, and he teaches at one of the most important schools of modern art of that period, the Bauhaus um, in Germany.